Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in. It's my pleasure to be here to continue our reading and discussion of the book Code Word Barbalon, the second book of the series. And it's a two book series, by the way, and a highly recommended two book series as well. We just got started yesterday at the end of the program on page uh, on uh, the 30th chapter of this book if you're following along in your own copy of this book we're on page 201 and the title of the chapter is the number of antichrist the number of antichrist and many of my listeners are going to find this chapter very interesting if you've never heard this information before you'll want to call friends and families Tell them to tune in, and if not, uh, to listen to the program in the First Amendment Radio Archives under uh, Inquisition Update for the uh, uh, Wednesday edition. Now, the number of Antichrist. What about the number of Antichrist? We know, of course, that the number of Antichrist is 666. But can it be proved that this number is also that of the Pope's kingdom? Revelation chapter 13, verse 18 states, quote, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. 3 score is Three times twenty, a score is twenty, so three score is sixty. So the number is six hundred and sixty six. Now, this we shall shortly undertake to do, the author says, but first, let me observe that the beast of Revelation 13 is the same beast referred to in Revelation 17. This is evident by the fact that both beasts have seven heads and ten horns and names of blasphemy. See Revelation 13.1 and Revelation uh, 17.3. Revelation 17, verse 3, says the woman, Mystery Babylon, is seated, quote, upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, unquote. Likewise, Revelation 13, 1 states, quote, And I stood upon the sands of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy, unquote, from the King James Version. Both beasts have names of blasphemies, both have seven heads, and both have ten horns. So we're talking about the same beast. Reader, if anyone tries to convince you that these two beasts are not the same, tell them it doesn't matter. For if they are not the same, they are twins. Now, let us then return to the number of the beast. 666. I touched upon this earlier in chapter 14, where the great Isaac agreed with Irenaeus that the number is, and then the author gives the the, uh, Greek uh, text, which represents 666, and his name is uh, uh, Latianos, and the number of his name is 666. And he said, this is, this is a quote from uh, an interesting book entitled Observations Upon the Prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse of St. John, published in London in 1733. Here we see that Sir Isaac has connected the prophecy of Revelation 13 to the Latin or Roman kingdom. What is the significance of this? Have you ever wondered why the Catholic Church is called the Roman Catholic Church? 
as to pose as opposed to say holy catholic church or just the catholic church was jesus a roman were any of his disciples romans save for paul who was a jew with a roman citizenship where were 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 any of of uh, of the apostles roman was peter from whom the popes claimed to have to have received their popedom was peter a roman so why is the pope's church called roman or latianos the answer to this is the first key to unlocking our riddle latianus latianos or latinos traditionally meant roman it is curious if not significant that the following names all contain the word latianos or latinus adding to 666 latianos deceptor which means the latin deceiver adds up to 666 Latianus sacerdos, which means the Latin priest, adds up to 666. Latianus rex deceptor, which means the royal Latin deceiver, adds up to 666. Latianus rex deceptor papa, which means the royal Latin deceiver, the pope. Okay, first of all, I'd like to apologize to my listeners. I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, it seems like the attacks continue, and uh, I only ask my listeners to pray and ask God's protection and provision so that we might continue with his business, exposing the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order, the number of the beast, 666. And before we uh, mysteriously went off the air, some unexplained reason. We went through the number of uh, papal uh, titles that numerically add up to 666, attributing Roman numeral equivalents to the letters of the names, which was a common practice in uh, ancient times. Uh, and it's extraordinary how many of the papal titles, and the, and he has many, in uh, Roman numerals add up to 666. It, it's beyond the realm of coincidence. It's almost beyond the realm of, of, of statistical probability. It, it's incredible is what it is. And were it not true, it would be incredible. Now, the author says, what a coincidence, reader. But now consider the following orthography, which is more to the point. And here we have the numerical equivalent of the word Italian church in Greek. It means it, it equals 666. And also the Latin kingdom equals 666. And here is the spelling and numeration of Antichrist in Greek. It too equals 666. Now here is the Pope's kingdom and his title written in different languages. And if you had a copy of the book and were looking at it yourself, you would see that his titles are given in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, all of which equal 666. Now this is what's uncanny. There's a portion of the scripture, and I wish I had thought to look this up before the program. Was it not true that on the placard that they nailed to the head of the cross was in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek the words, here is Jesus, the King of the Jews? Is that not true? But here we have the equivalent of the Pope's titles in the same languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, equals 666. It's really extraordinary when you think about it, that the scriptures would include that the Roman government, over which ruled the Jews, made sure that in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, 
Jesus' title was, was posted on his cross. And here we have the biblical Antichrist titles in Hebrew, Greek, and uh, Latin, totaling 666. Many might think this is just coincidence, but I don't think it's coincidence at all. Now, the author continues. He says, why is it, why is it significant that the Pope's title, Vicarious Filii Dei, which means the replacement of the Son of God, adds up to 666. As I showed in Book 1, quote, it was a method of practice among the ancients to denote names by numbers. And the representing of numbers by letters of the alphabet, quote, gave rise to a practice among the ancients of representing names also by numbers, unquote. Quoting further, it says, examples of this kind abound in the writings of heathen, Jews, and Christians. So it was a widespread practice. And it says, thus, it is logical that Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, would use the name of a man to reveal to us, to reveal to us, but to hide to his en the enemies of God the identity of Antichrist. It says of the number of Antichrist, quote, it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, threescore, and six, unquote. Reader, we have found the man, vicarious filii day. And so now we know the home of Antichrist. The Latin kingdom, the Latin church. That's the home of Antichrist. Now, chapter 31 is entitled, Antichrist in Her Glory, The World at Midnight. It begins with a quote from Revelation chapter 9, of verse 1 and 2. It says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke. Unquote. And it includes a photograph of uh, the dome of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome at night. A very gruesome picture once you realize what this really represents. And the author continues, he says, resplendence, uh, excuse me, Resplendent rose the gracious gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, traveling far and wide at so great a speed that the scriptures declared all the Roman world heard the gospel. See Colossians chapter 1 verse 23, and it says Eusebius, who lived from 263 to 340 A.D., wrote, quote, Thus, under the influence of heavenly power and with the divine cooperation, the doctrine of the Savior, like the rays of the sun, quickly illuminated the world. The voice of the inspired evangelists and apostles went forth through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Book 2, Chapter 3. But the prince of darkness, Grim, was soon to rise like smoke from the bottomless pit, darkening both earth and sky, to counter the work of God. In this enterprise, he created what we now know as the papacy, his most enduring and most successful franchise. To quote historian James A. Wiley, quote, The noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world, for it spelled a backward step from light into darkness. As in a figure of speech, the smoke of Satan arose out of the bottomless pit, darkening the sun and the air. If I may borrow another figure of speech from the Jesuit Malachi Martin, quote, it was then that the smoke of Satan had entered the church, unquote. Indeed, as one author would write, quote, the accession of the Roman Catholic Church to power marked the beginning of the Dark Ages. As her power increased, the darkness deepened, unquote. 
Another quote, rights and liberty were gone. Oppression and corruption everywhere prevailed, writes Reverend S.H. Ford. Says a great Catholic writer, quote, These times, though the ambition and cruel tyranny of the popes were, un were extremely unhappy. That from Phil Bergamus of uh, AD 908. Gilbert Genebrard, who spent ten years in his chronicles, also alludes to the same period. Quote, this is called the unhappy age. In this time there was scarcely anything done worthy of being remembered by posterity. But the age, he adds, was chiefly unhappy in this one thing, that for almost 150 years, about 50 popes did utterly degenerate from the virtues of their ancestors. From his work, Chronicle uh, 1, Chapter 4, published in A.D. 855. Historians all con concur. The darkness of the world began with the rise of the papacy. History confirms the Bible. And that's why his, the study of history, true history, is so important to our research and understanding of the scriptures. The author continues, he says, And what darkness it was indeed, that the earth was stationary, that the earth was flat, that Haley's Comet was an agent of the devil, etc., etc. And all this was based on the authority of papal infallibility, a miserable fallacy, no doubt but one that possesses an influence over minds, which, if they should stop to reason, they would not care to tolerate. On this subject of papal infallibility, I quote again from Dr. James A. Wiley, quote, The Church of Rome cannot avail herself of the excuse that such an opinion was held by her in the Dark Ages when there was little knowledge of any sort in the world. In those ages, that church taught as infallible that the earth was stationary while the sun rolled round it, and that the earth was not a globe but an extended plane. The apology that this was before the birth of modern astronomy, however sa uh, satisfactory in the mouth of another, would in her mouth be a condemnation of her whole system. The ages were dark enough, no doubt, but infallibility, infallibility then was still infallibility. Why, it is precisely at such times that we need infallibility. An infallibility that cannot see in the dark is not worth much. If it cannot speak till science has first spoken, but at the risk of falling into gross error, why, we think the world might do as well without as with infallibility. A prophet that restricts his vaticinations to what has already come to pass possesses no great share of the prophetic gift." Unquote. Werner, a cloistered monk of St. Barbara, gives this character of that age of papal dominance, quote, there began an effeminate age in, in which the Christian faith began to degenerate exceedingly and to decline from its ancient vigor. People were given to soothsaying and witchcraft, and the priests were like the people." Unquote. We're speaking about the dark days of the world, the very noon of the papacy, when she ruled supreme in the world. And we're returning to those days. We're rolling the clock back a thousand years with the Vatican Judgment Led to World Order. The time God people knew about it. We'll continue right after the break. You're listening to Andrew Vision Update on first and number three. Oh, this quote we just finished from James A. Wiley, and he says, Werner, a cloistered monk of St. Barbara, gives this character of that age of papal dominance. Quote, there began an effeminate time 
in which the Christian faith began to degenerate exceedingly and to decline from its ancient rigor. People were given to soothsaying and witchcraft, and the priests were like the people. And this is what happens when the gospel is removed from the hands of the people and replaced by Roman Catholic superstition. The people became derelict of mind, not having the light of the gospel. It was replaced by doctrines of demons and darkness. This is what characterized the rise of the papacy. It says, reader, this is the picture of papal Rome's meridian glory, drawn not by the hand of an opponent, but by her learned defender, says Ford. And Henry Hallam says, concerning this period of darkness and calamity, quote, the torrent of irrational superstitions which carried all before it in the 5th century, and the progress of ascetic, that is, monkish rituals, monkish ascetic enthusiasm, had an influence still more decidedly inimical to learning. I cannot indeed conceive any state of society more adverse to the intellectual improvement of mankind, unquote. But it was not just intellectual darkness, but spiritual too. Indeed, to borrow a phrase from the great historian Gibbon, quote, the throne of the Almighty was darkened by a cloud of martyrs and saints and angels, unquote and other idols which were made, quote, objects of popular veneration, unquote. The testimony of Gibbons is confirmed by Mosheim, who states that, quote, in this age, referring to some two decades later in the 7th century, they who were called Christians worshipped the wooden cross, the images of saints, saints so-and-so, and so forth. And the bones of men, men they knew not whom. This is what depravity enveloped Christianity after the rise of the papacy. And it says, and Voltaire, that Jesuit educated rebel, seemingly turned anti Catholic, asked tongue in cheek about the hundreds of alleged fragments of the cross of Christ found all over the Catholic world in her various churches, quote, are those pieces of the true cross that would suffice to build a hundred gunships? They worship they know not what. Their idolatry and darkness of mind is legion, and it still goes on today, and amazingly, it's still called Christianity by Christians. Chapter 32 of the book is entitled, The Debasement of Christianity, Pilgrimages, Flagellations, Self-Mortification, Etc., one of the great aims of the enemy of God was the debasement of Christianity. In the book, History of European Morals, W.E.H. Lecky writes, quote, The writers of the Middle Ages are full of accounts of that inveterate prevalence of incest among the clergy, which rendered it necessary again and again for the monarchs to issue the most stringent enactments that priests should not be permitted to live with their mothers or sisters. And I'll let you reflect just a little bit what that means. Depravity in spades. Now, Lecky continues, he says, we may not lay much stress on such isolated instances of depravity as that of Pope John the Twenty Second, who was condemned, among many other crimes, for incest and adultery, 
or the abbot elect of St. Augustine at Canterbury, who in 1171 was found on investigation to have 17 illegitimate children in a single village, or an abbot of St. Paleo in Spain, who in 1130 was proved to have kept no less than 70 concubines, or Henry III, Bishop of League, who was deposed in 1274 for having 65 illegitimate children. But is it is a, but it is impossible to resist the evidence of a long chain of councils and ecclesiastical writers who conspire to depict far greater evils than simple concubinage. No reader, we need not lay much stress on any isolated incidents because as Leakey says, quote, the writers of the Middle Ages are full of accounts of these facts. And today, nothing has changed much. We see the same high incidences of sexual intercourse between the confessors, that is, the priests, and the penitents, and between the confessors and the penitent spouses, a matter that has always been a common occurrence under the confessional system of the Roman Catholic Church. Quote, in every country, said Hallam, the secular and parochial clergy kept women in their houses upon more or less acknowledged terms of intercourse by a connivance of their ecclesiastical superiors, unquote. Hallam adds, quote, two crimes had become almost universal in the 11th century and excited general indignation, the concubinage of priests and the sale of benefices, that is, the sale of revenue-paying church offices, unquote. Continues Hallam, a writer of respectable authority asserts that the clergy frequently obtained a bishop's license to cohabit with a mate. Now he's going to talk specifically about pilgrimages, flagellations, and self-mortification. The next Romish practice instituted was, quote, the festivals and commemorations of martyrs, unquote, which, quote, multiplied with the numberless fictitious discoveries of their remains. Said Gibbons, quote, the throne of the Almighty was darkened by the clouds of martyrs and saints and angels, which became the objects of popular veneration, unquote. John William Draper comments, quote, Pilgrimages were made to Palestine and the tombs of the martyrs. Quantities of dust and earth were brought from the Holy Land and sold at enormous prices as antidotes against devils. The virtues of consecrated water were upheld. Images and relics were introduced into the Roman Catholic churches and worshipped after the fashion of the heathen gods. It was given out that prodigies and miracles were to be seen in certain places as in the heathen times. The souls of the darkened Christians were invoked. It was believed that they were wandering about the world and haunting their graves. There was a multiplication of temples, altars, and penitential garments. The festival of the purification of the virgin was invented to remove the uneasiness of heathen converts on account of the loss of their lupercalia, or feasts of Pan. In other words, Rome simply said, give up your heathen idolatry and convert to our form of heathen idolatry while we just paste the, la the label Christianity on top of it. That's what Roman Catholicism just Christianized heathenism. And I do not apologize for that definition. And anybody who has done a modicum of research into the Roman Catholic Church can come to no other conclusion. The author continues, and we must not forget to mention fasting, which became, quote, 
the grand means of the church for spelling, uh, repelling the devil and appeasing God, unquote. Yes, the Roman Catholic Church made a great deal out of fasting, and it still does today. He says, we are told by historian Hallifield uh, Kosgine O'Donoghue, who, who said, quote, the act of eating, they made an exercise, an exercise of penance by mingling whatever was most nauseous with their food. And it would literally sicken the reader, were the victories here to be related, which they achieved over the reluctant stomach, and which, with other details of sanctimonious nastiness, are recorded in innumerable Roman Catholic books for edification and example. That's right, to demonstrate their holiness, they would mix the most vile concoctions with their food thinking that they were worshiping God. Now, to this sanctimonious nastiness, they added also the monkish doctrine of merits of absolution and self-mortification. The strength of the will was worshipped as one would an idol. Heroic piety was made an indispensable part of man's salvation. The extremes of humiliation and debasement was promoted as a source of pride and proof of holiness. The worse the austerities, the most excessive, the more the monks were regarded by the people as living saints. Self-mutilation was added as one of those virtues to adorn the Christian grace. And here we have a quote that must certainly come from the 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 Council of Trent, It says, whoever shall affirm that penance, as used in the Roman Catholic Church, is not truly and properly a sacrament instituted by Christ our Lord for the benefit of the faithful to reconcile them to God as often as they shall fall into sin after baptism, let him be accursed. In other words, anybody who questions the legitimacy of these practices by the Roman Catholics is is accursed by the Vatican. This is forced idolatry. This is forced superstition by the papacy upon the people on pain of excommunication and eternal damnation. Were we back in the heydays of the papacy to scoff at these, or try to in in any way correct these people who were mixing vermin and feces and any other disgusting concoction into their food, those who would whip themselves with chains, if we were to try to correct any of them, we would be labeled as accursed by the Roman Catholic Church. These are true facts of history. Now, said Bishop Newton, quote, flagellations at solemn seasons under the notion of penance, a great variety of religious orders and fraternities of priests, the shaving of priests, or the tonsure, as it is called, on the crown of their heads, the imposition of celibacy and vows of chastity on the religious of both sexes, All these and many more rites and ceremonies were equally parts of pagan and popish superstition that was bought wholesale into the Roman Catholic Church. They brought it wholesale right into the Roman Catholic Church. They just call it Christianity. Quote, in pursuance of this principle, writes Robert Southby, Practices not less extravagant than those of the the Indian yogis and the more loathsome were regarded as sure indications of sanctity. It was deemed meritorious to disfigure the body by neglect and filth, to extenuate it by fasting and watchfulness, that is, the deprivation of sleep, to lacerate the body with stripes, and to fret 
the wounds with siluses of horsehair. In other words, cut themselves and then whip their 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 wounds, their self-inflicted wounds with whips made of horsehair to just prolong the agony. This was considered holy in the Roman Catholic Church. It says the youth, the use of warm bath conducive to health and to cleanliness ceased throughout Christendom because according to the morality of the monastic school, that is the school of the priests, Cleanliness itself was a luxury, and to procure it by pleasurable means was a positive sin. In Europe, they, that is the monks, devised other means of debasing themselves. There were some saints who never washed themselves and made it a point of conscience never to disturb the vermin, who were regarded as the proper accompaniments of such sanctity." Unquote. Some became famous, continues Southby, for the number of their daily genuflections. Others for immersing themselves to the neck in cold water in the winter while they recite the Psalter. The English saint Simon Stock obtained his name and his saintship for passing many years in a hollow tree. Saint Dominic was distinguished for his iron dress and for flogging himself with a scourge in each hand day and night. And the blessed Arnulf of Villers in Brabant immortalized himself by inventing from his own, for his own use an under waistcoat of hedgehog skins. That is, he made his underwear out of porcupine skins for those of us in the Midwest. And they call this holiness. They call this sanctity. Doctrines of demons. And it's still called Christianity today by Christians. And all of this paganism and sanctimonious nastiness was sanctioned by the popes. Does not Revelation 17.4 aptly describe this Antichrist system as being full of abominations and filthiness? Reader, the Roman Catholic Church has done with the religion what the pagan barbarians did to civilization. It has ravaged Christianity and has made that religion degraded and loathsome in the eyes of rational, sensible people. How loathsome we shall see in the coming chapters. And ladies and gentlemen, if you comprehend what the new world order is, we're returning to these days. We're returning to those days of moral and spiritual depravity. And isn't it already apparent Chapter 33 of the book is entitled Infallibility or Incredulity. The Church of Rome claims the Pope to be the inerrant guide to all truth. Yea, they say, as Christ's successor, the Pope is the moral teacher of mankind and the light of the world. This is a quote taken from a work entitled History of the Christian Church, Volume 5, Issue 2, published by Charles Scribner and Sons of 1910, page 42. And it says, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, the attributes of Christ while he was on the earth have been transferred to the Pope. Thus they say the Pope has authority to direct the leaders and the peoples of the world through his infallible gift of truth. The decrees of the Council of Trent tell us, number one, that the Pope is immaculate, infallible, and irresistible to any earthly tribunal, or excuse me, irresponsible to any earthly tribunal or power. In other words, there's no court in the world that can try him. No accusation can be made against him. Is, uh, making an accusation against the Pope is like making an accusation against Christ. Does he not claim to be the replacement of Christ on earth? 
He says, he is judge of all, can be judged by none, kings, priests, nor people. He is free from all laws, so that he cannot incur any sentence or penalty for any crime. Number two, that all the rulers of the earth are his subjects and must submit to him. Number three, that all the earth is the Pope's diocese. And according to Roman Catholic canon law, listen to this one, all property belongs to the Roman Church state. And the Pope is supreme emperor. That's right. The earth is the Pope's and the fullness thereof. Is this not Antichrist? Who could argue? These things are instituted in Roman Catholic canon law, which forms the basis of this global cult. And he commands the kings of the governments of the world. And he's certainly, most certainly, going to control the new global government that they're establishing. The author continues, he says, And yet, says one writer, as history confirms, quote, there was never any pope until the 6th century. As to infallibility, 868 A.D., Pope Nicholas II and Photius excommunicated each other. In 1881, Pope John was put to death for his intolerable wickedness. In 896, Pope Boniface VI was expelled before the end of his first month on account of his atrocious lewdness. In 964, Pope Leo was caught in adultery and slain on the spot by the husband. In 1045, Benedict was banished for his wickedness. Sylvester III was expelled, and Gregory VI elected in his stead. Thus, three popes were living at the same time at Rome, each expelling the other. Which one was infallible? Then there is the dilemma of Rome's past and recent history. The moderns of the Church of Rome today claim that the atrocities, nay, the barbarities, sanctioned and often commissioned by the popes, were the product of a darker, less civilized time. But these Catholics cannot have it both ways. On the one hand, they say the popes are infallible and have always been throughout their long line of succession. And on the other hand, they say the very infallible popes acted on the principle and values of the Dark Ages. Reader, is that not when infallibility is needed most? When all is dark and erroneous? Where was the pope's infallibility then? What use is infallibility when it can only show the way in enlightened times? but acts with the common spirit of barbarians in less enlightened times. If the popes were not infallible in those times past, they cannot be infallible now. If the popes could be in error then, they can certainly be in error today. If the Pope's infallibility comes only after years of miscalculation, mistakes, trials, and errors, then that is no infallibility, but mere cunning. That we grant them for the next to dupl for next to duplicity, cunning has been their most enduring trait. We inquire: Were the popes infallible when they declared the earth to be flat? The Bible, an inexhaustible source of heresy, that liberal of conscience was one of many absurd and erroneous doctrines and a most pestilential error? Was Pope Calixtus III infallible when on June 29th of 1456 he foolishly purported to excommunicate the apparition of Halley's Comet as an agent of the devil? <laughs> 